Hey everybody, Erica here it is BioLite's Kickstarter Live. We are here in Fire Pit Alley, located at New Lab over in uh, downtown Brooklyn. And I am here with Ryan, our head of combustion science, oh, yes. and Tim, our lead engineer behind the fire pit. So I'm gonna give a really quick rundown of what's gonna happen today, um, and then I'll let you guys get right to it. So we're gonna do a quick overview of the fire pit, everything that comes with it, and then we're gonna do startup. We're gonna fire up a charcoal fire pit, and then we're gonna fire up a wood fire pit as if you wanted to start a campfire from scratch. Then what we'll do is we're gonna focus on the charcoal. We're gonna do a quick cooking demo. And then what we'll do is we'll be able to show you transitioning from charcoal to firewood. So let's say you start cooking and then you wanna move into a campfire, we'll do that. We'll answer a bunch of questions. We have a whole host of questions we've been collecting over the last few weeks. And then we also will answer some questions that are coming through the feed. Lastly, when everything's all cooled down, we'll show you how to clean and take care of your fire pit as well as get rid of ash pack it on up and then call it a day. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, please note that if you ask a question, if we see that it's similar to a question we already have in the hopper, we'll get to it. We might not answer everything immediately right away. Um, and then we'll also make sure that if we don't get to all questions during this Kickstarter live, we will answer it in our FAQ or back on the message board in the days ahead. Um, and then lastly, if you have friends or family who can't be here right now for the Kickstarter live, no worries, uh, this will be available for replay over the next 48 hours. All right, so let's get started. So overview time. So with the fire pit, uh, one question that we're getting is, what exactly comes with my Kickstarter pledge? So we'll give you a quick rundown. Um, your fire pit comes with a Kickstarter pledge. It's gonna be the body of the fire pit, the power pack, the inner fuel rack, and for those who are asking, it does come with the grill grate. So for folks who are asking for cooking attachments and cooking accessories, you already have one. You have the grill grate right here. And we're actually gonna cook on it in just a couple of minutes. Um, do you guys wanna share what some of the basic specs and dimensions are? Uh, yeah, for example. Uh, so it, the size of it, you know, the tail is uh, 27 inches long, uh, 13 inches wide, and just under 16 inches tall. Uh, it weighs just under 20 pounds at 19.8 pounds. Uh, the, uh, the metal body is uh, coated in high temperature uh, mild steel. And the internal fuel rack is uh, stainless steel along with the jet tube. And the, uh, the fuel top is also stainless steel. Great. Um, and then one question that we've been receiving sometimes is, what is the size of the firewood that I can fit inside of the fire pit? So one important thing to mention is, this is about uh, 17 inches lengthwise, and it's designed to fit standard firewood, so cord firewood. So about 16 inches in length is the ideal size because it's already gonna come that way. It's a typical length of square pit. Yeah, when you go out and buy cordwood, you're typically going to see these 16 inch long pieces. So it's been designed around that really common, easy to purchase form factor. Cool. Um, so then one last thing, one other thing that comes with your fire pit pledge is our solar carry case. So this is a waterproof carry case um, that has an integrated solar panel that will recharge the power pack on the side. So again, as we mentioned, um, this is 10,400 milliamp battery. Yeah. So 10,400 milliamp battery can provide up to 24 hours of burn time. Um, and so we're gonna get right into one of the most popular questions we've received, which is why doesn't this have a TEG inside of it? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, TEG stands for thermoelectric generator. It's a technology that's found in some of our other stoves where we convert heat from the fire into electricity. We didn't put that into this stove and that is on purpose. Um, main reason being, if we were to put a TEG inside of here, that would make the stove four to six hundred dollars. It's not worth making tech for tech safe. And what we found was that solar was a better renewable and self-reliant energy source to power the system. And then on top of that, also the actual design and engineering of the fire pit leads to why we didn't incorporate a tech as well. Ryan, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, what we're looking at here is our first product that's designed not to concentrate heat, but to radiate heat in a social setting. And so 
Whereas our other stoves do a really good job of having a concentrated heat source to supply to the tank that can convert to electricity. This device is, is designed to spread heat around. So it's a little bit harder to access that heat and turn it into electricity. So again, um, the power pack itself is detachable. So if you wanted to take it inside or charge it from your car or charge it from a larger solar panel, you can detach that and easily recharge it. Again, with the integrated solar carry case, again, the idea is that when you're not using it and it's out in your backyard or out by the cabin, it'll automatically be recharging itself thanks to the protective cover. Uh, so let's get into burning, guys. Yeah, like so what we're going to do first is we're going to just light some charcoal. So Tim is using um, a bag, a three-pound bag of charcoal, just right there. We're going to light that up and let it burn down so that we can start cooking. And while that's burning down, we'll give you guys an in-depth look at how to start a wood fire from scratch. So Tim's just lighting the charcoal here. He's using some charcoal that's already pre-impregnated with some uh, starter fluid. You can use normal starter fluid as well. And then if you're gonna burn your uh, fire pit using wood, you know, we'd encourage you to start with pretty small kindling to make your job easier. Um, the fire pit's designed to, to burn cordwood in these big chunks, but you don't necessarily wanna start that way. You wanna make sure you can start with some newspaper or some fire start if you have it, and then work your way up from these kind of small pieces up to medium sized pieces and then eventually to your cordwood. We'll show you that in just a second as soon as the charcoal gets lit up. And so while Tim is getting started on this, I see a couple of questions coming in about the power pack itself. So one question is, can you use the fan and charge devices at the same time? So again, this battery doubles as a power bank so you can detach it and charge other devices. At BioLite, we believe in being able to share your energy. If you want to use that power out to other things, it's up to you. Um, so the answer is yes, you can power out at the same time. Uh, one recommended way is using BioLite string lights. So let's say that you're in a backyard or something like that. You can actually plug some string lights up off of the power pack as well. You can also do things like charge a phone or charge a headlamp or other devices. The one thing that you really want to be careful about, though, is that you have a charging cord that is long enough to take it away from the fire. As we said earlier, this radiates a lot of heat. It is intended to radiate a lot of heat. So if you decide that you want to be charging at the same exact time, you need to make sure you've got clearance away from the fire. Um, when you're not burning, you can detach the power pack and it basically becomes a portable power bank. Uh, and then the other question was, can you have pass-through charging? So let's say that you are near, you have an extension cord in your backyard, or you have an outlet that you can access. Um, can you be charging into the power pack and making sure that it's staying topped up at the same time that the fan is in use? And again, the answer is yes, you can. Um, but similar idea of making sure that that charging cord has clearance away from the fire. You don't want it draped across the body of the stove. Yeah, basically just be responsible, right? We don't want you to set up tripping hazards. This is still a fire, it's really hot, and so you want to be safe first and foremost whenever you're setting up any kind of cables going in or out of the device. All right, so we've got the charcoal burning. Um, right now the fan is on, to, what, is the, what setting is the fan on? Uh, I've been off. Oh, you've got it off, okay. So right now we have it in the off setting to make sure that it doesn't snuff out a weak flame. Um, once we start to see the coals kick up, we'll turn it on so that it helps burn down the coals so that you can start cooking. Uh, I'm going to throw it over to Ryan, who's going to talk to you about, let's say you don't want to use charcoal, you just want to go straight into a campfire. Here's how you start it up from scratch. Yeah, thanks, Erica. Um, like I said before, you just want to make sure you start with some smaller size kindling so that you can get a small start uh, a small fire started, sorry, and then work your way up to the larger logs, eventually getting to the cordwood that this thing's been designed to burn. Um, and you'll notice I've used a little bit of this since we've been starting. This is a really simple fire starter. It's basically just a bunch of compressed sawdust with a little bit of paraffin wax. Uh, you can buy all kinds of different types of fire starters like this, and um, we'll be offering some of this with the products as well. So I'm going to put a little chunk of this down at the bottom. I've made a, a tiny little teepee with these small sticks. You could also start with newspaper, um, maybe a little bit of lighter fluid if you wanted to start that way. And we'll get started. You have that lighter, Tim? Yep. Thank you. So uh, while Ryan is getting that going, um, Tim
Tim, we're getting a couple of folks who I think were late to the rundown. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to give a quick, just like pointing to what the different components are and what they're made out of? Sure, yeah. Uh, so the main body is a uh, mild steel with uh, high temperature paint. Um, the handles are stainless steel. The uh, fuel rack that's on the interior that holds the charcoal or the wood uh, is, is also stainless steel. The three jet tubes, stainless steel, and then the, the, uh, the grill top is also three or four stainless. So reinforced stainless steel, stainless steel, and then I actually want to focus briefly on the mesh. So we call this x-ray mesh because at nighttime uh, it disappears and you can see a floating fire. Um, but you guys have an engineering point of clarification, which is that it's actually not mesh, uh, it is perforated metal. So do you guys want to speak to that and to the durability of that body? Yeah, definitely. I mean. The beautiful thing about using this material is that you can see through it like a mesh, but it's got a lot more structural integrity than the kind of wire mesh you might be used to in a backyard fire pit. Um, and so this is a, a sheet metal that's been punched out with small holes, and th those holes are about 20% open area compared to 80% of intact sheet metal. Um, so it's a really robust uh, carbon steel sheet metal, and it's been coated with a high temperature paint. Um, and so related to that, another question that we're getting, guys, is the durability of the stove. So uh, one of the things that we talked about is clarifying that the mesh is actually perforated metal, which is a really strong, a strong structural integrity. Do you guys want to speak to the nature of um, the paints and coatings that we're testing and what we're looking for in the durability of the fire pit? Yeah, definitely. I, I think just to start out, like Tim said, all the, the most high intensity areas of the fire, like the jet tubes where the the air and the fuel mix and the fuel rack where the fuel is going to sit along with the grill on top, all of those are made out of high temperature stainless steel. And then for the body of the stove on the exterior, we're using a, a carbon steel, but it's been covered with um, an industry standard high temperature paint. And we're continuing as we go through the later phases of development to look for different options uh, in terms of paints or enamel coatings that can really optimize uh, the durability of the stove. I think the most important part is that we've built it with a thick enough perforated metal that when it heats up, it doesn't do a lot of deforming. Typically, if the metal deforms a lot, it can break down that outer coating. And by making it nice and stiff, we're gonna keep that coating intact. Um, and then, so that's kind of what we've been able to do on a manufacturing and material choice end. I think the other side of durability is care and maintenance. So one of the questions that came up on the board is, will this rust? Um, and so I think the answer is, anytime you've got oxygen, moisture, and high heat temperatures, rust can come into play. And so it's about how you can mitigate that through proper care. So do you guys want to give some tips on how to take good care of it so there's no rust? Yeah, I think there's a great analogy with, with your typical um, grill or fire pit that you might buy that uh, doesn't have a fan, those things require maintenance, right? You usually get a cover, and if you're going to leave this thing out in the elements where it's exposed to salty air or rain, we want to make sure it gets covered when it's not in use. So we provided a cover with the product, and the most important thing is just keep it clean and keep it dry. If you're going to try to clean the device, make sure when you wipe it down, you actually get it dry so that you don't have standing water sitting on the, the metal components. Because as Erica said, Anytime you have heat um, and oxygen and then available moisture, you're going to run into rust issues. So we want to avoid that by taking good care of the device and using the cover that's been supplied. And related to that, um, one thing you definitely shouldn't do is don't pour water into the fire pit. So I know that a lot of the time with typical campfires, let's say that it's late and your fire's still going and you're tired and you want to call it a night, you dump a bunch of water on it and then you're done. Don't do that with the fire pit. And the good news is you probably aren't going to ever have to do that with the fire pit because the body of this fire pit holds up to four pieces of wood at a time. So you're not going to overbuild your fire. A lot of the time, the reason that you have to dump a bunch of water on a campfire is you, you've overbuilt it. You made it too big, it's burning for too long, and you need to find a way to put it out quickly. With our fire pit, you're going to get a lot of heat with only four pieces of wood. And if you need it to cool down or you want to call it a day, you can turn it up to the max setting and that increased airflow will help burn down the fuel even faster. Um, so again, don't put water into the fire pit itself. 
avoid moisture, and that's going to be one of the best ways that you can avoid rust. Um, back to the question of the solar cover and its durability. That solar cover is designed where we are currently sourcing the final materials to make it waterproof. So if you make sure that this is on and it fits snug, you should be good to go. Um, at the end of this, when the fire pit is fully cooled down, we will show you how to pack it all up. Um, so Ryan, do you want to talk about being able to build up a campfire and what your, the size of the fuel that you're using right now? Um, yeah, sure. Like I said, uh, we're just going to want to start with small pieces of kindling to get going as we work our way up to the, the cordwood. And it's really great if you can even split some of your cordwood into a medium-sized piece. So maybe if you want to grab one of those, you can see. When you purchase cordwood, you're going to often get some pieces like this and also some larger pieces. And so being able to split some of these larger pieces into sort of medium-sized, something like this will really be helpful. So you can see the kindling that I've put in, um, it's very dry, it's very energetic fuel, and so it's jumping up, releasing a lot of fuel gas um, very quickly right now. As I get into the larger size sticks and then um, turn the fan up, we'll be able to better balance that fuel and air, get a really clean, efficient burn going. So that actually is a good question. So as, um, as you are building up your fire from the beginning, if it smokes a little bit in the beginning, that's okay. Do you guys want to speak to kind of how the fire needs to build and how you achieve a smokeless fire? Yeah, uh, starting off with proper small kindling uh, and really getting some good flames going and then adding like slightly progressively larger pieces of wood. Um, so you start to build up a bit of a coal bed. Uh, and then as you move to larger pieces, um, you can modulate the fan speed to inject more air over the wood. Uh, so once you get to a point you have enough flame going, you can put in some fairly large pieces, crank up the fan speed, and uh, you will see the wood combust like fairly quickly. Yeah, and remember, whenever you see smoke, that's just unburned fuel. So when the when the wood gets hot, it releases fuel in the form of um, liquid particles and also solid particles. And as those pass through the flame, they're going to get burned. But if they're not burned, they'll escape and, and cause smoke. And so in order to burn those particles, we need heat and we need oxygen. So early on in the fire, you may be um, not warm enough with the entire coal bed and device to get the heat that you need or you may not have enough fan bringing in the oxygen that you need. So you're always looking to balance those things. It's pretty straightforward, and I think after you operate it a couple of times, you'll get the hang of it. Uh, but you just want to keep an eye on, uh, as you feed the fuel, making sure you bring in enough oxygen to burn all that, that fuel gas off. So um, this is actually a good moment for a quick public service announcement, which is, uh, as you can see, we're burning charcoal and we're burning wood. You're not seeing any smoke come off of the fire pit, which is awesome, and that's science, but this is for outdoor use only. The fire pit is for outdoor use only. And speaking of outdoor use, we're getting some questions about where outside can you use it? Most notably, can I use it on my deck? Um, the answer is no. Uh, so the answer is you can do it at your own risk, um, but for us, we recommend using things like packed dirt, gravel, sand, concrete, things like that. Um, and if you guys want to talk about how this radiates heat and where it radiates heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the bottom of the fire pit is also uh, stainless steel and it does radiate heat downwards uh, because we intended it to radiate heat in all directions to create a warm campfire setting. Uh, so over time, uh, the, the surface does get warm and it can exceed the temperatures of a composite deck. Uh, and layer even wood. So that's why I recommend fireproof surfaces. So yeah, so if you have a fireproof surface, be it concrete blocks, be it a slab, something like that, um, that's what you need to use this on. This thing puts out a ton of heat and it's gonna put it out in all directions. Um, and so again, if you have you know a packed surface in your backyard, that's ideal. Um, if you wanna lay some gravel or a sand pit, like a fire pit that you would use at home, um, that is our number one recommendation. So definitely for outdoor use only and make sure that you have it on a fireproof surface, um, which is relatedly, uh, we'll show you guys, you can see that uh, Ryan and Tim are sitting right now. This is a great kind of camp chair height to be grilling and cooking. 
you don't want to put this up on a table. Um, and then when we start cooking, maybe we'll have you guys stand up. You still can access this while standing up, but don't put it up on top of a table to be cooking. All right. Uh, so another thing that we, I think we should talk about is um, the question of sparks and the sparks coming off of the, so some folks have mentioned that like in the video when we were stoking the fire, they saw some sparks coming up and we have some folks asking about spark arresters. Um, so if we wanna maybe speak to the grate a little bit and then speak about kind of what's different about our fire pit and how it helps mitigate sparks. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, well, I guess first and foremost, as we said before, the, the perforated metal that we're, we've used to create the body of the fire pit is only 20% open area. And these holes are very small, less than two millimeter diameter. And so uh, embers and, and sparks typically are not able to escape out of the sides of the, the fire pit, even though all that nice heat is, is able to escape. And then on the, on the top of the fire pit, um, we've actually specially designed the grill grate to be uh, optimized for cooking, but also is pretty narrowly spaced in order to catch those the biggest sparks and embers. Um, the only place that sparks really can escape is up in that that grill area, um, and the grill does a pretty good job of keeping those down. Now, as as was mentioned, um, when you're refueling and stoking or stirring the fire, that is the, the one opportunity um, for sparks and embers to, to exit the device. And that's really the reason why we didn't include a dedicated spark arrester, um, because the, the situation would really be similar. If you have to remove the spark arrester to stir or feed the fire, that's the opportunity for the sparks to leave. So again, with, with any open fire, you don't want to burn this thing unattended. Make sure you're standing around, keeping an eye on it, and always use your best uh, fire safety judgment. But I think you'll see that the, the sparks are not really an issue with the design. Um, and then, I don't know, forgive me if you guys mentioned this, but you talk about the width of the grill grate? Yeah, I mean, the, the exact dimension is about 10 millimeters. So yeah. um, pretty consistent with a, a coarse mesh like you might see over a, a dome fire pit or something like that. Yep. Um, all right. So. We are, the coals are burned down. So we're actually gonna move for the sake of focus. We're gonna move this fire pit out of the way. We're gonna let that burn down so that we can show you guys what cleanup and de-ashing looks like. But right now it's time to get grilling. So uh, Ryan and Seth, Seth wave, wave to everybody. Uh, so we're gonna just get this off screen and we're gonna put our attention on the charcoal. Yeah. So we've got some steaks that we're gonna grill up. And I'm not sure if people noticed, but I was changing the fan speed as the charcoal was starting to burn down. Um, so it, once the flame started to get about halfway burned down, I increased the fan to get more oxygen into the coals. And uh, sometimes it can cut down the amount of time by half that it takes for the coals to get ready. Uh, blowing so much air onto the onto the charcoal stack up. So Tim, do you want to speak to the surface area of the grill top? Yeah, it's uh, about 185 square inches. Uh, it's about seven inches wide and about uh, 18 inches long. As you can see, it gets pretty darn hot. So, so we, you want to tell them what we're cooking? Yeah, we have some uh, some steak uh, skewers here. Like uh, delicious uh, looking marinated yeah. steak skewers. Yeah. And to the vegetarians out there, this cooks vegetables as well, very nicely. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the things that I want to call out is that it's smoking right now. Um, and this is going to be like a standard barbecue. So even, if, even with a you know propane barbecue, if you're going to put some um, marinated steaks with fats and oils inside of them, you're going to see some smoke come off of it anyway. It's the smell we all love of a barbecue. And so this is unrelated to the combustion of the wood inside. And this is more about the fat drippings and the oils and marinade coming off of the um, meats into the fire. Um, so Tim right now is cooking eight skewers. Um, so this can feed a lot of people. This is designed to have a large surface area. Um, you can cook a lot of, uh, you can cook up to uh, 
um, eight burgers. You can cook 15 hot dogs, 20 hot dogs, I think we fit. Uh, another another very important feature is uh, what, we, what we call the weenie rail. Um, so there's a guardrail around the top of this so that if you are packing it full of food, nothing's going to roll off, nothing's going to fall off. You can actually pack a ton of delicious food onto this grill. Um, another related question to this is we have folks asking us, are you going to make a griddle? Are you going to make a lid? Are you going to do all of that? Um, and the answer is in the current design of the fire pit, no, we're not. Um, and that's because we designed it to be a hibachi grill. And hibachi grills are open-faced grills that use things like a charcoal bed to provide high temperature cooking and a really nice hot sear. Um, if you're looking to do things like bake or cook low and slow, that is not what this is optimized for. Um, by all means, you're welcome to experiment, but uh, that is not what this is designed for. This is designed to grill food uh, really, really well using charcoal or the leftover embers from a campfire. Um, related to that, we have some folks asking if we can use things like skillets or pots or things like that. And again, um, the answer is you do that at your own risk. It is not designed for the fire pit. That is not what this is optimized for. Uh, the, the fire itself or the charcoal itself is not designed to be like a burner. So a lot of the time with stoves that have sort of a burner um, optimization, you've got a really concentrated flame and that can go under a pot or a kettle or a skillet really well. This is more dispersed, which makes it ideal for grilling and direct contact. So we've been Starting cooking. To smell really good there, yeah. <laughs> so just so folks have a time stamp on this, we've been cooking for about five minutes and these skewers are almost ready and we're about to feed eight people in five minutes. Um, related to this, we have folks asking, how do you clean the fire pit? And I think this is a great chance to, to talk that through. Do you want to take it? Yeah, that sounds great. That's, that's a really good question. And again, to our earlier points around durability, you want to take care of your fire pit, um, keep it nice and clean. And so one important thing is keep the grill clean. You're going to have food on there. Like Tim's demonstrating now, you're going to have burned pieces of food. Make sure you use some kind of grill brush to keep those, those grates nice and clean. And then when you're done cooking, whether it be with charcoal or wood, there's going to be some ash and some char at the bottom of the fire pit. And we can show you on the, the other one that's not so hot a little bit later, but there's a door at the bottom of the design where you can slide open the door and kind of shake the fire pit and get all that, all that ash and charcoal to come out. It's really best practice to do that after every cooking session. Um, once everything's got nice and cool, you want to get all that stuff out of there. There's some corrosive acids inside the charcoal and the wood that eventually can can cause wear and tear on the fire pit, especially if you're leaving it outside in the elements. Um, and then, again, if you want to clean the side of the device, just a wet rag, really simple, um, similar to your, your grill at home. Give it a little wet rag, rub down, and then make sure you get that nice and dry before you leave it. Um, and then just for clarity, one person is saying, I noticed that the grill piece isn't set in, and one side is and one side isn't. I think what you might be seeing is a matter of perspective. So that rail that you're seeing is what's sitting on top. So this actually is sitting fully inside of the fire pit and it can cantilever. So an easy way to refuel is it slides out and then it stays stable. So this is actually a really nice way if you're looking for a cooler surface, let's say you want to like just warm up some hamburger buns or keep things cool. Um, cantilevers off to the side, so it actually is sitting very stably on top of the fire pit. Just wanted to make sure that for folks who are asking, um, maybe it was just a matter of perspective. Great. Um, so we are almost done with our skewers, and I think that what we're going to show next is moving the fuel rack down and adding firewood. So this is a really great party trick. What's nice about cooking with charcoal is that it is instant fire starter for your campfire. Um, so why don't we get these skewers up and off? We've got a really nice sear, really nice caramelization on the meat. And again, to the vegetarians out there, we'll cook veggies next time. We got some in the video. Um, but you can see this puts out a really hot flame. You can cook for a lot of people. But let's say that you're ready to move away from your, your cooking surface and into a campfire. So that's what we're going to do next. Seth, you want to take these bobs and Last. feed yeah. with them? 
So um, what's going to happen now is uh, Tim is going to lower the fuel rack. Um, we, because we're a bunch of tinkerers, made our own little contraption to move the fuel rack down. So he's going to show that on one side. Do you want to just tell people how you made that? Uh, it's just a piece of stainless steel wire uh, with a little hook on the end, a little handle on the top. And there's a little notch that the, the rack sits into uh, for the handle. You just drop it down. Uh, so we made this, but you can also use a pair of tongs. Just drop it down to the lower position, and it's ready to get some firewood on it. So yeah, so we're not putting any additional fire layer or anything else like that. We're just going to put some wood directly on top of these poles, and we're going to have a fire going in no time. Actually, you want to put a bigger piece? Yeah. Get, get some. yeah. Yeah, I will. So uh, you can start to see the flames coming up. And then once we get airflow, so it's going to smoke a little bit. And then once we get the airflow going, it's going to catch. Um, this is a great time to talk about fire safety. So we've got some folks asking, and I think this is related to the question about the ember catcher. Um, if this abides by uh, park standards and fire bans and things like that, um, the most important thing you can do is check with your local park. Everything varies. Uh, things vary from park to park. Things vary from ranger to ranger. Um, and so for us, one thing that's really, really important is taking personal responsibility of your surroundings and making sure that you do your local research. We can't give a blanket statement because for every park that says yes, there might be a park that says no. Um, so do your part and ask your local ranger and let us know about it. Let us know what you hear from your local ranger. We can put a database together. We're happy to do that. But this is one where some crowdsourced information will be really, really helpful. So as you can see, we put some fire, <laughs> we put some fire in and here we go. It's really um, not some heat right now too. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're sitting pretty close exactly. in order to stay inside the shot here, but I think normally <laughs> we can stand back a little bit more. Um, and I actually think that uh, a good a good related question to that is how much heat does this put out? And I think the design, the idea is like how many people can be around this? Like you know how many people can fit around this campfire? Yeah, exactly. Um, you'll probably see on the Kickstarter uh, that we advertise you can put three or four of these large pieces of cordwood in the fire, and that that design point was chosen because it's it's analogous to like a ring fire pit that you might see at an average campsite. Um, and so in terms of the heat that this can provide, it's very similar to a, a ring fire pit, but you can do that with a little bit less wood and have a little bit more control over it as well. Um, by using the fan, we can really dial in the amount of oxygen and fuel release that's happening inside the fire. And so at a, at a fairly high fan level, you can get you know, 15 or 20 people sitting around one of these and, and gathering the warmth from the fire. Um, conversely, if you're just a few people playing some guitar and you want to relax for hours and hours, you can keep the fan at a pretty low setting and kind of have some control over that heat release. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of heat. And uh, as you said, Erica, if you think about it in terms of, of people sitting around the fire, it's, we've definitely done 15 to 20 people on, on some of our camping trips and prototype testing. So um, I think that, uh, so Tim, one thing that Tim just did is he turned the fan setting down. Do you guys actually want to talk about the fan setting and, and how it correlates to the size of the flame? Because it's actually uh, a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, it makes sense when you talk about the physics of it, but for a lot of folks, um, you're going to only use the first two settings because that's going to create the biggest campfire flame in effect. So do you guys want to talk about the relationship between the fan setting and the flame size? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, as Erica said, it's a little bit counterintuitive because you might think about the fan setting as a way to make the fire bigger or smaller. Uh, and that's true in terms of the heat that gets released, but not necessarily in terms of the size of the flames that you see. Um, as I said earlier, the flames and the smoke are really the unburned fuel. Um, and so in order to see a flame, that means you've got fuel that's still combusting. As we add air with the higher fan settings, that combustion starts to happen in a more concentrated fashion and lower down into the fire. So even though the height of the flames is going to come down, the total heat that's released is actually going to go up. Uh, so it is sort of a counterintuitive thing. And um, for anyone who orders one of the fire pits and hooks up the Bluetooth connected uh, app that we've designed, you'll be able to play with that on your phone and really see in real time how that fire behaves. That's the fan 
and the air airflow goes up and down. Um, and then to that point, uh, you saw that Tim was pushing a button on the power pack. One thing that we want to make super clear to everyone is the fire pit is operable manually. You can operate all the functionality of the fire pit via the button on the side of the power pack. So you can access all four fan settings. Um, the benefit of the app is that if you're like, you know, let's say you're sitting and you're really cozy and you, the last thing you want to do is get up, you can control the fan settings from your phone. And the other nice thing about it is that the app will give you real time feedback on the battery life that's left inside of the airflow pack. So if you want to manage your energy consumption, that's a nice benefit of the app. Um, so to that effect, do you guys want to show um, the different fan speeds and their impact on the size of the flame? Yeah, let's maybe get a little more wood in there. Yeah, first. let's get one more piece of wood in there and then we'll go through those different fan settings. Um, we're also seeing a lot of people upvoting questions of cool down time and de ashing. Um, we're going to get to showing that in a couple of minutes, but once the embers are out, so once you de ash it through the trap door at the bottom, um, it takes about five to 10 minutes for the entire thing to cool down. So it's again, it's really, really durable, but a thin stainless steel. So once the charcoal and embers and heat sources are out, it'll cool down very quickly. Yeah, as you can see, this is on the low setting right now. So you're getting quite a bit of flame licking outside, outside the unit. Uh, and as we increase the fan speed, you see it start, the air jet starts pushing into the flames and they start going down gradually. So as you go up in the fan speed, the flame gets pushed back onto the fuel to increase that combustion. And then on max speed, it's really blowing a lot of air on this and it's creating a lot of turbulence. So now that that other log is caught, maybe you can go back to a lower fan setting we'll see the flames come back up. Getting a little bit of wind right now, it's messing with our experiment. Which there is actually go. a good time to talk about wind. Uh, so uh, some folks have asked, you know, if I'm in super windy conditions, um, what does that do to the power pack? Is the power pack going to melt? What's going on with that? Um, and the answer is no, uh, it's not designed to melt the power pack. Do you guys want to talk about how we designed the offset and the height of the power pack? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go ahead. Uh, so we have about a one inch offset from the manifold to the back of the, uh, the power pack. Um, and the manifold itself, the way there's air flowing through it, actually creates uh, quite a good insulating layer between the fire and, and the plastic. Um, and then being down below the rim of the fire pit, uh, the chances of flames washing onto the, to that end of the product is, is very low uh, because it's at a lower level. Yeah, I think I'll just add, I mean, as you see today, we've got a little bit of breeze coming through this, this small alleyway and it's blowing the flames in every direction. When the wind blows from my left to right, you'll see the flames kind of go over the side a little bit and lick across the power pack. Um, if that happens, the plastic's going to be fine. We've designed this with a very high temperature glass filled, fiberglass filled plastic that can withstand high heat. But if you do see that kind of behavior, especially if it's consistently blowing in one direction, the best thing to do is just flip the fire pit around, make sure those flames are going away from the, the power pack. Um, and just as a heads up, if you do have a roaring fire going, you will want some sort of heat proof fabric or material if you're picking it up and moving it. Um, another thing that's important is when the fire pit is cool, you can lift it up yourself and just kind of carry it. When it's really hot, you don't want a live fire in front of yourself across your torso. So it's a two person job. Um, you'll want one person on either side and then you can move it safely and, and carefully. Um, this policy is really not to move it yeah, if you have a large fire. Don't move it if you can, yeah. but, um, but if you're in those really windy conditions. Another thing to mention about really windy conditions is if it's really blowing around, it's going to disrupt our airflow. Um, and that's just because it's overpowering the uh, air injection. And so you might see some smoke escaping from the fire. Um, and that's because our kind of vortex pattern that we've calibrated is getting disrupted by a stronger force. Anything to add to that? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, we really tried to carefully design uh, the amount of fuel that can be stored in the middle compared to the way the air gets injected into that fuel. And when a breeze comes by and, and blows off the balance of all that injection, you may see puffs of smoke. 
Um, but again, there are, like, it can handle wind. I don't know if you guys can see, but given our location, we're actually in a little bit of a wind tunnel. I don't know if you can see, like, my hair blowing around, but we are in some slightly windy conditions, and you can see the fire is functional. It is functioning. It is working. We're talking about, like, really strong gusts of wind and, and really highly breezy conditions. Um, the question about the power pack that's coming in is, again, because there is a rechargeable power bank inside of it, can you speak to the life cycles and how many charges and the idea of, you know, the longevity of the product? So we're designing the body to be really durable. Let's talk about the power pack side. Yeah, so the power bank, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, let me just take this one. The power bank, power bank inside the, of the power pack um, is a uh, 10,000 milliamp hour battery. It's about 40 watt hours. It's a lithium ion battery bank um, with some protection circuitry in there and some battery management to make sure you can never overcharge or undercharge the pack. Um, and it's going to have a really long life cycle in terms of the number of charge cycles it can go through. Um, up to over a thousand, approaching two thousand charge cycles. And so that, for typical usage, is going to be way more than the lifetime of the product. If you think of how many times you're going to recharge this thing and take it out for use. Again, you can run the, the car pit on one charge for up to 24 hours on lowest fan setting, and even on a really aggressive um, set of fan settings, you're going to get four or five hours out of each uh, charge cycle. Great. Um, I'm just catching up on all these questions. Guys, great questions that are coming in. Um, one thing that I want to mention is we have a lot of questions coming in that have already been answered. So at the end of this, we would suggest that you hit replay. This will be streaming for 48 hours after the campaign and you'll be able to watch it. We're also going to do like a super cut of this and we'll do some timestamps of where certain questions are being addressed. Um, so we talked about all of those things. Oh, one question about fuel that was coming in is, um, is this a pellet stove? Can you burn pellets with it? Uh, we, we recommend against that because uh, pellets will just collect on the bottom. The fuel rack uh, won't be able to hold them properly above the primary uh, jet tube underneath. So it would really not burn very well. So we recommend against that and uh, maybe look forward to something in the future. Um, and then relatedly, uh, in, the, in the category of fuels, can you burn driftwood? Um, yeah, you can burn driftwood. Uh, typically, you know, driftwood can be high in, in salts. Uh, so if you were exclusively burning driftwood all the time, you'd want to make sure to clean off the fire pit, as we said before, so that those corrosive salts don't build up in the in the bottom of the device. But sure, driftwood's fine. I think like like any time you're building a fire, the drier the wood, the better. So you, you don't want to be pulling wet driftwood right out of the ocean and trying to burn it in the fire pit. Um, but as long as it's had a chance to dry and as long as you're diligent about cleaning out the ash uh, after your cooking sessions, then go for it. Cool. Um, one question that we have, and I will say that um, because this is Kickstarter, we still have some miles to go in terms of finalizing production. So what we're burning today are prototypes. Um, one question that is coming through is questions about the fan noise and the fan levels. Um, again, we're not finalized. We're still working on final housing, but can you guys speak to the, the fan noise and, you know, I don't know if we have a decibel rating, but like, I know from qualitatively as a, as a lay person, um, I hear the fire more than I hear the fan. I hear the crackle and, and I hear the sound of the fire, but can you guys speak to incorporating that into the design process? Yeah, the, uh, the size of the fan on this product is, uh, greatly larger than our previous products. So um, I mean, we do admit that those make more noise than uh, say the camp stove does. Um, but it's it's probably, like Erica says, it's, it's, it's not overpowering the, the sound of the, of the fire itself. And we feel like when it's within a setting of a social environment, it, it really kind of is just in the background and goes unnoticed. I think another important thing too, if anybody's familiar with with operating the camp stove um, is that this is a larger scale fan, as Tim said. So as you get to that bigger size, you actually spin at a slower rate. Um, so the pitch of the noise is a little bit lower. And it, it seems to be pretty soothing, at least to me, when you, when you hear that. It's not a, a high pitch whine at all. Um, I will say if you if you have the fuel rack in certain configurations and it, it's laying a little bit askew, um, you may hear the rack itself vibrating. So you want to just kind of give a little tap on the side of the device to get the rack to settle and that vibration should go away. 
Um, and then related to the air flow system, uh, somebody asked, um, how do you keep the air jets from getting clogged? Yeah, uh, I've actually been keeping an eye on that over the year plus of testing. And uh, I've found that because there is air pushing out of the air jets, that uh, ash actually doesn't fall inside them. Uh, so running the fans at the various speeds, you'll find that the, the jet tubes will remain clean. Cool. Um, so one last question is, um, can you use this in the rain? And so I'll speak to that from firsthand experience. This can handle drizzle. So I was actually testing this prototype last week and it was raining out. Um, and it can handle some drizzle, but you want to make sure that everything is dry thoroughly at the end. So again, that goes back to the rust question. You want to make sure everything is dry very thoroughly by the end. Um, if it's pouring out, just like a campfire, it's not going to work. Uh, you know, you have really wet fuel. Um, it's going to be really hard to sustain that fire. Um, so yeah, it can handle some drizzle. If you know that like a little patch of, of rain is going to come through, it can sustain that. But if you know that it's a day that has a 90% chance of rain, you should probably rain check the fire. Um, so are we ready on the other one? Okay, so what we're gonna do is, again, this is, this, we're gonna move this one out of the way very carefully, and now we're gonna focus on our other one. So if everybody remembers, we started that other fire pit at the beginning of this. Um, that is now burned down to coal and ash, and we're gonna show you the cleaning process. Um, so yeah, Tim's gonna take it away. We brought an ash can, so if you're in a situation that has a fire pit or an ash ring or something like that, um, these contain live embers. You want to practice all the fire safety that you would be doing with a typical fire pit or charcoal grill. Um, same thing goes for this. So if you want to talk about what you guys, let's make sure we don't obscure it. Uh, you want to move yeah, the... Yeah, so we'll do it this way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so as Erica yeah. said, she's got a... Yeah, we got to move it in. We're off camera. She's got a uh, an ash bucket here in order to collect the embers. And Tim's still using his tongs here because the bottom part um, might still be warm. You can do a quick check. This one actually, the fan's been running for quite some time, so it's pretty cool. We could we could handle this, but you want to always make sure you check that before you just start grabbing pieces of the stove. And Tim's going to show you where the the ash door is, and then empty out the ashes for you. So there's a handle here in the back. You don't mind pulling out. Yeah, so the handle's right here. Pull that open. And then you just kind of shake all the pieces of charcoal and ash. In this case, into our ash bucket, or if you're at the beach, you can dig a little hole in the sand, put it in there. Uh, if you're at the campsite, you can throw it into the fire pit circle. And the one thing to call out right here is that um, the, the fire pit right now is substantially cool. It's down, it's completely out. Um, if you were to have live embers, like let's say you still had some leftover embers, um, you would pull out that trap door using tongs. You would not want to touch it directly because it would still be quite hot. Right. Um, but then same standard procedure of dumping it out, shaking it carefully, um, covering it with water. And then do you have your uh, brush with you? Um, so one other thing is if you really want to take care of it and have it look like it's good as new every time, we actually recommend a simple painter's brush. Do you want to show it to the camera, Tim? So it's really simple. It's like 50 cents at the hardware store. Um, that just helps get that really, really fine ash out of the bottom. So that fuel rack, so we actually haven't shown that on camera. We want to show yeah. that. Um, that's your fuel rack. So this is what is going inside it's going up and down whether you want to cook with charcoal or you want to cook with firewood um, and so you can remove that easily um, that's gonna change color just because it's literally inside of the main event um, but that's okay it's made of it's a stainless steel yeah yeah it's made of a stainless steel oh, um, and so what Tim is doing now is that now that he has removed the fuel rack brush out the ash um, and he's going to get that out there and that gives it a really nice deep clean. As for the outside of the fire pit, um, you can wipe that down with a dry rag or you can wipe it down with a damp rag. You just need to make sure that you have a really nice dry finish at the end. Do you guys have any other suggestions on maintenance and care? 
Um, no, I think you've said it. The, the nice thing about the Power Pack, um, it's a really large battery bank, as we said before. So for short camping trips, you may find that you've got all your cooking done, you've had some social time around the campfire, and you still have power left in your Power Pack, and it's the, the last night of your trip. So you can always feel free to pop the Power Pack off of the stove and take it with you into your tent. Um, there is a charge out port, which is a standard USB-A. So if you need to top off your cell phone or your headlamp or something like that inside your tent, this is a really handy way to bring that power with you. Great. Um, so let's break out the solar cover. So we're going to show what pack up looks like. Um, so thing, sorry for the noise. Sorry about that. Um, so another thing that's nice too is that uh, for example, with this fire pit, just, just to call out, this is not maximum fuel capacity. So what we burned today is roughly, uh, sorry, we're packing off camera. Bear with us while we move a live fire. All right, um, so the campfire that we just showed you was only at about 50 to 60 percent of the total fuel capacity. So this was a nice, friendly, you know, campfire for about three, four, five people. But you could double the amount of firewood that we were burning and get a much bigger flame. We didn't do it because it's 82 degrees out and we are in direct sunlight, so we were not into it. Um, but again, you can see the fire that we made. And again, imagine double the fuel and you'll get a really big, beautiful flame. And just as a quick reminder, you get that big, beautiful flame on the first fan setting. So you actually get big fire for maximum runtime on the first fan setting. Let's go back to pack up. Got the, uh, the panel and the bags put in the middle. So as Tim is packing this up, uh, one thing that we want to call out is that it has straps that go around the carrying case that stabilize the fire pit inside. Um, and then we have these shoulder straps on top. So it makes it really portable. It makes it really easy for you to take to the beach um, or if you have a cabin. So unlike other fire pits that you kind of are either permanent or semi-permanent because you're not going to carry like a big round fire pit with you, um, this is designed to kind of mimic the shape of a cooler. Um, and so it's easy to pack, it's easy to throw in your trunk, it's easy to take with you. Um, and so it snaps onto the bottom, um, and then you have it fully protected and fully covered. So you can leave it outdoors if you want, uh, and, and the waterproof cover will protect it from the elements. Um, it also is durable. You know, we do want you to keep it out in the sun, so that's the point of the solar cover. So it will be able to withstand the sun. Um, and then the solar panel itself uh, is it, going to charge up the power pack to full. So completely empty to full over a four to five day period. The reason that we did that is the idea is that you're burning Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you're leaving it out in your backyard and you are charging it during the week. Now, that being said, let's say that you're like, well, what if I want to use it on a Tuesday? That's fine. You can get plenty of burn time in a single day's charge. Um, all right, you just guys want to pick it up and just well, show? Just to that last point, I wanted to make sure you guys saw when, when Tim was finished packing it up, he had the handles sitting on top of the solar panel like that. Um, in order to get the solar panel to help recharge your power pack, you want to make sure it's nice and exposed uh, and that it's got good visibility to the sun. So you want to get as many hours of, of bright sunlight as possible. And then, yeah, as Eric was saying, real simple. Carrying like this, you can actually put it on like a backpack if you want. I've never tried that myself, but maybe now's the time. There we go. Look at that. Not too bad, right? This is a, a biolite. I'm just happy I'm taking a lot. Um, and then related to that, uh, a really nice thing too is that um, if you want, you can pack firewood inside of the fire pit. So let's say that you know that you're going, you know, to the beach or you're just going out into the backyard. Um, really nice way to transport everything is you can actually fit the fuel you plan to burn inside of the fire pit. Um, one thing that we want to mention is Tim just packed this up 
but in the final iteration is that there will be a micro USB cord. And so one of the things that you're gonna do is to ensure that it is auto recharging when it's not in use, you're gonna make sure that that micro USB cord is plugged in between the solar panel and that power pack. So micro USB in, and then the USB out that is inside of the power pack is to charge out to other devices. So with that being said, we're gonna do a little quick fire round um, of some questions just to make sure that everybody feels like their answers are being addressed. One more time, if we didn't get to your question, chances are it already got answered either in our FAQ, on our comment board, or maybe even earlier inside of this broadcast. So be sure to go back and check out the full live stream. Um, so here we go. Number one, why doesn't it have a tag? It doesn't have a tag because it would be a $600 stove. It's also not optimized for a tag. It's designed to radiate heat and not concentrate heat. Number two, uh, what comes inside my pledge? fire pit, fuel rack, grill grate, solar carry case, and then that we have a whole bunch of other additions and items and pledge levels that you can do on our on our Kickstarter page. Check it out. It's all described right there. But the standard exclusive is the fire pit, the fuel rack, the grate, the power pack, and that solar carry case. That solar carry case is going to retail for $60. So if you back us on Kickstarter, you're getting a $60 case for free. Um, and then uh, lastly, two other questions that we had that just warmed my heart is, uh, can you invest in BioLite? Is there, are there, is there stock that you can buy? Um, currently, BioLite is a private company, uh, but please know that backing us on Kickstarter actually really helps us grow and succeed and scale, not just with the work that we do in our outdoor products, but also our work in emerging markets. For those who don't know, BioLite operates across India and Sub-Saharan Africa, bringing clean cooking and lighting and charging to families who are living in energy poverty. So when you support us, you support the work that we're doing everywhere. So thank you for that. Um, and then lastly, we're getting some questions about our t-shirts. Uh, so we've, we've heard some requests about whether or not you can pick up a BioLite t-shirt. And all I'm going to say is that's a uh, great suggestion, and stay tuned. Uh, anything else that you guys want to add? No, just uh, thanks, uh, everybody, everybody that's been a backer on Kickstarter, and everybody that hopefully will become a backer after the, the broadcast here. Um, like I said, we just took this thing up for some testing at the lake last weekend and had a blast. We, we never used our ring fire pit at the campsite once. so. Um, yeah, it's a great product. I hope you like it as much as we do. Yeah, and we fit, I don't know if you said this, but we fit 15 people around a single fire pit. So this is good for groups. We can, you can feed a lot of people, you can warm a lot of people, um, and it's a great time to have a great, big, beautiful fire without any of the smoke. Thank you so much for watching. Please tell your friends, do us a favor, share a link to the campaign today. Let's see what we can do. We're the featured project of the day on Kickstarter today. Um, let's see if we can get things even crazier. <laughs> Thanks for watching so much. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. See you on the comment board.